Hello, dear listeners. I'm Shana Zwaiz with Iraq Matters. This week, we are all about Prime Minister Nouri Al Maliki's visit to Washington, D.C., and his scheduled meeting with President Barack Obama at the White House. Here at Epic, we have been working hard to put Iraq back on the agenda here in Washington, D.C., so the White House meeting with Iraq's Prime Minister is a welcome development. Mr. Maliki's visit presents the Obama administration with an opportunity to articulate a clear, comprehensive U.S. strategy for helping Iraq address its serious problems of governance and for promoting lasting peace. The president also has an opportunity to re-engage with the American people about the importance of U.S. relations with Iraq and ongoing efforts to promote Iraq's peace and development. With 2014 being an election in Iraq and U.S. support for the democratic aspirations of Iraqis under question, Mr. Obama should also make it clear that America's support is for the people of Iraq and for Iraq's democratic institutions and processes, and not for any one person. As a primer for this important meeting, EPIC Director Eric Gustafson sits down with Ahmad Ali, an Iraq research analyst at the Institute for the Study of War, to talk about what the Maliki government hopes to get out of this week's meeting. But first, a campaign update. Our petition on change.org to put Iraq back on the agenda is gaining momentum with thousands of new signers, moving us closer to our goal. As you listen to this podcast, please take a minute to invite your family and friends to support our campaign by sharing the link iraqmatters.org. That link, iraqmatters.org, redirects you to our petition page on change.org, where you can sign the petition and also find useful sharing tools. Today is Friday, November 1st. As you've been following, today marks the first meeting between President Obama and Iraq's Prime Minister in nearly two years. The need for action is vital for peace in Iraq and the region. Currently, more than 3 million Iraqis remain displaced, adding to a regional humanitarian crisis that includes more than 6 million displaced Syrians. With winter approaching, displaced and vulnerable populations across the region are at risk, while the humanitarian assistance that's needed is underfunded. Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and Turkey have been hosting the influx of Syrian refugees. These five countries have only received part of their funding, specifically in Iraq, which currently shelters 200,000 refugees with only 45% of the funds needed to care for them. Join EPIC in pressing the Obama administration and Congress to do more to support renewed diplomacy assistance, and humanitarian action for peace in Iraq. Now here's the interview with Ahmad Ali. Hello, this is Eric Gustafson with Iraq Matters. I'm here with Ahmed Ali. He's the senior research analyst and Iraq team lead for the Institute for the Study of War. And we're here to do an extended Iraq update. Uh, this is actually an extremely important week for us. On Friday, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki will meet with President Barack Obama at the White House. This is the first such meeting in nearly two years, and it's extremely important in terms of the developing relationship between the United States and Iraq. At a time with escalating violence um, in Iraq, uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq is resurgent. Uh, they are now operating on across Iraq and also in Syria uh, with the formation of the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham. In addition, there's been uh, reports of uh, remobilization of the militias, and that's of serious concern. And we are leading into national parliamentary elections next year, uh, which will determine the next prime minister of Iraq. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of issues right now, um, and it's really important. But I'd like to just start, Ahmed, if you could uh, give us a little bit of a context going into this meeting. What are some of the latest developments on the ground in Iraq? Well, Eric, I'm uh, very happy to be here and uh, delighted to be part of the podcast. The major developments that uh, have been taking place uh, recently uh, have to do with the uh, uh, resurgence of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI. It is back to uh, levels that we have not seen uh, since 2008. It is able to carry out operations in uh, various parts of the country. Uh, it is uh, targeting Iraq Shia civilians. It is also targeting uh, 
uh, Iraqi Sunnis who are allies of the government and uh, it is uh, seeking to establish control of terrain in the country uh, and these developments uh, are uh, similar to what uh, uh, we saw in 2006 uh, one of the most recent developments uh, with regards to the resurgence of uh, AQI is uh, AQI's uh, operations in Ambar province they have uh, increased recently and AQI has been able to take over uh, and control towns for uh, short period, periods of time and that has led to uh, imposing curfews by the Iraq security forces in some of those towns. Wow, that's serious. I mean, as I understand just the numbers alone, the United Nations estimates 7,000 casualties of Iraqis so far this year, uh, which is a huge increase. Um, You're saying since that's the largest increase since 2008? That the figures that uh, we have seen uh, indicate that mm -hmm. and uh, it is uh, causing uh, fear within the population about the future of uh, Iraq. Yeah. And the, the, uh, for our listeners, just to kind of put this within context, how serious these operations are, imagine an average of about, what, 68, 70 car bombings a month and every 10 days, multiple location attacks which um, th we haven't seen that kind of, that scale of violence since 2006, 2007. Uh, what, what are some other developments um, in Iraq that kind of provides us some context for this meeting that will be taking place on Friday? The other development is uh, the remobilization of uh, Iraq Shia militias. And uh, in one of Epic's previous po mm -hmm. podcasts, uh, we discussed the uh, number of militias in Iraq. And those militias are uh, remobilized now. They are doing so politically and militarily uh, inside Iraq and uh, outside uh, Iraq as well. And as part of the remobilization effort is the desire to counter uh, AQI's uh, resurgence. But uh, that remobilization is uh, uh, dangerous uh, and it does have a number of uh, consequences that will uh, lead to increasing violence in Iraq. In some ways, it seems like it's the, the exact dynamics that Al-Qaeda in Iraq wants to kind of drive a wedge and create more sectarian tensions that then can uh, push the country even further toward civil war and that's to the benefit of those extremist groups. That, that is what uh, AQI is uh, driving towards. Uh, the major difference uh, that exist at the moment is uh, the Iraq security forces. Uh, it is uh, it is uh, very large in numbers, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, it is it's, it's the strategies that it has uh, uh, have not uh, been uh, adapting to the mm -hmm. nature of challenges. Uh, so the Iraq security forces can do a great deal to quell this violence, but mm -hmm. uh, they have to. Uh, build better relations with the population uh, in order to uh, win the support and the assistance of the population. So it sounds like drawing some of the same lessons that the United States had in its own experience uh, in on the ground in Iraq, uh, that you, you can't necessarily apply heavy-handed security solutions to political problems. You also have to try to work with the local population. Many of those lessons are still applicable. Mm -hmm. uh, so the other major development, as I understand it, um, relates to planned elections. Uh, so what's happening in terms of those uh, planned elections for next year? Uh, Iraq's uh, 2014 elections are uh, significant because uh, they will determine the prime minister of the country and uh, as a result, the future of the country, the direction of the country. And as of now, uh, there is no exact date for the elections. Uh, the Iraqi uh, Council of uh, Representatives, which is the Iraqi parliament, decided to uh, hold them no later than April 30th of uh, 2014. Uh, but uh, discussions with regards to the elections law are still taking place and uh, there are tensions uh, because of uh, those discussions uh, and those tensions are primarily uh, between uh, the Iraqi Arabs and the Iraqi Kurds. Mm -hmm. uh, the Iraqi Kurds feel that uh, previous elections laws were uh, unfair 
to uh, to them and to their uh, chances of being uh, fairly represented in the Iraqi uh, parliament uh, and these discussions are ongoing at the moment uh, and the elections law is the dominant political issue uh, in Iraq. And uh, as I understand, one of the major issues has to do with whether or not the entire country of Iraq will be treated as one district <coughs> or whether or not uh, each of the province, Iraq has 18 provinces, uh, will be treated as separate uh, districts. As I understand, the, the Kurdish parties would like the entire country of Iraq to be treated as a single district because it would uh, be more ideal, it could increase their representation on the, in the national parliament because, of course, Iraqi Kurds dominate the, uh, some of the northern provinces, but also then there are Kurds in other cities and those votes would also count towards the number of seats it could win in parliament. Um, but if it's divided up by uh, provinces, then it would work it wouldn't work in their favor. Is that one of the issues? Uh, I think you uh, you hit it uh, on you know on the head uh, okay. uh, because uh, these are the discussions that are taking place now. And uh, uh, just for the listeners to know, uh, Iraqi politics is a, uh, is a very difficult business. Mm -hmm. uh, it is always uh, protracted. It is always tense. Mm -hmm. Things always uh, get resolved at the eleventh hour. Uh, and this one is, ex is expected to be so as well. The major difference that this discussion has uh, with the, when compared to discussions that took place in 20, uh, 2010 mm -hmm. when the elections t took place then is that you have increased violence in the country now and uh, any uh, increased uh, and escalated political tensions will lead to uh, increased violence. Uh, yeah. Therefore the context and the moment uh, are very different uh, and uh, much more consequential for the country. Yeah, yeah I, kn I know there's there's been a number of op-eds recently. Um, there was a piece by Emma Sky and uh, Ramzi Mardini about um, some of the issues leading into this meeting. Um, and I know they were actually making the argument that uh, that it's important for the provinces to be treated as their own districts because it allows for the competition, you know, locally and for the local population to feel like they are being represented in the parliament rather than just this, you know, one national election, you know, where you just become, where you get grouped it together with the general population. But is that like, in your view, in terms of, you know, as an Iraq analyst and thinking about what's best in terms of creating more stability, do you come out on one side or the other on that issue? I think the Iraqi voter has uh, made uh, that view very easy to mm -hmm. understand. Uh, the Iraqi voters clearly want to vote for individuals they know uh, from their own province and uh, they don't want to vote for a national uh, level list uh, mm -hmm. or national level coalition uh, in a single district uh, that will if you if you vote for a, a national coalition in a single district, uh, the uh, representation becomes uh, less cre clear uh, for the voter, uh, and that's why the Iraqi voter uh, prefers uh, the multiple district uh, system as opposed to single uh, district system. And and also an open list versus a closed list. Uh, very, very crucial as well for for the viewers to uh, or for the listeners to get an idea of uh, what an open list uh, is and what a closed list li is. An open list uh, means the voter can uh, elect uh, a specific candidate. They can give their vote to that specific candidate. A closed list uh, means you give your vote to the coalition and then uh, the political pa party leaders have more of a say on, on, on who gets into the parliament. Uh, this is something uh, that the Iraqi voter is completely against. The Iraqi voter wants to be able to vote for the right person uh, because they expect services from the right, that right person mm -hmm. and they want to, to uh, hold that person accountable uh, for their performance. Uh, a closed list system uh, normally does not uh, facilitate the accountability process uh, in the eyes of the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. The, the Institute for the Study of War has a great blog. Um, I should mention it to the listeners. Uh, you can go there at understandingwar.org. 
And I know in a recent post, uh, you were talking about rumors of, um, or reports, I should say, not even just rumors, but actual reports that an idea was being floated and that the idea may have originated from Prime Minister Maliki's office about the formation of a special Baghdad uh, division that would be composed of militia members, but specifically uh, members of the Mati army, the Aseb Ahal al-Haq, uh, or AAH, and Qatab Hezbollah. Of course, the huge concern, these are uh, Shia militias, some of which are backed by Iran, uh, some of which are even affiliated uh, or believed to be closely linked with the Al-Quds force of Iran. In fact, Qatab Hezbollah, their fighters have been um, fighting alongside the uh, government in Syria, so involved in the Syrian civil war. But the, you know, there's, there's these reports. Can you kind of put that in context? I mean, first of all, why would the Maliki government even propose such an idea? What's behind that? Is there are there political uh, motivations going on, and then what's the latest on that? Is that leading to the actual formation of a of a special division or not? Well, the reports uh, when they came out were uh, uh, very serious uh, about the formation of uh, this force, and the idea was uh, was that the force will be supported by the government uh, and will work with the security forces. Uh, as of now, uh, no concrete steps have been taken uh, on the ground to form that force and uh, move forward with uh, deploying members of, of that potential force. Why the reason uh, it was uh, it was floated is that uh, the Iraq security forces, despite their uh, uh, best effort, uh, have not been able to uh, provide uh, security adequately. In, in some cases and uh, there is a much needed review for the performance of the security forces and the strategy of the Iraq security forces therefore the idea was for that force to act as a, a security provision force in Baghdad uh, to counter the threat by uh, AQI mm -hmm. and it is uh, possibly intended to absorb the pressure uh, from the Iraq Shia population that was forming and that was uh, uh, leading to uh, actions by the population to defend mm -hmm. themselves and mm -hmm. uh, in some cases the militias that you that you mentioned in fact deployed uh, on the streets of Baghdad uh, for in very visible uh, mm -hmm. ways uh, which is uh, something we have not seen since 2008 but the idea is uh, a risky uh, mm -hmm. idea because uh, uh, if these uh, uh, groups are combined into one force uh, uh, first of all they do not uh, get along themselves they mm -hmm. have uh, disagreements uh, about a number of issues and they might uh, clash with each other uh, mm -hmm. over territory and over turf second uh, their authorities uh, are not clear uh, and therefore they can be involved in uh, uh, sectarian killings or uh, uh, killings based on identity mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, that's a dangerous uh, escalation um, overall uh, security provision should be up to the Iraq security forces uh, uh, militia members uh, and the uh, vigilante forces uh, should not be uh, deployed to provide security uh, because uh, doing so will uh, certainly lead to increased violence. One counter argument might be, well, what about in Anbar with the Awakening Councils and the, the militias that were formed in Anbar? As I understand, the real difference is that in that case, you know, you did have the local population forming militias to try to uh, put a stop to Al Qaeda and some of these attacks, but they themselves hadn't already been involved in violence. Where in the case of these militias, we're talking about militias that were involved during the worst fighting, the civil war in 2006, 2007. They've already carried out violence, they've done forcible displacement. The idea of trusting them, especially in mixed population areas, is dubious at best. That is a very accurate description of uh, the issue and uh, what we have with these groups is uh, there are groups that 
were closely involved in the civil war in 2006 to 2007 and they also attacked the uh, u.s forces uh, during that period of time and leading to the withdrawal of u.s forces and uh, if you deploy them to uh, mixed areas uh, where you have iraqi sunnis and iraqi shia you do have to uh, wonder about the potential treatment that the Iraqi Sunnis would receive in that area. Uh, or not even the Iraqi Sunnis, but anybody who is uh, considered a political opponent, whether we're discussing a secular political party or uh, an Iraqi Shia political party uh, that is uh, against that particular force or that particular unit that will be deployed in, uh, in a certain area. So the, the discussion about uh, forming this force have to be taken very seriously and it is something that has to be on the radar of, of anybody who is watching Iraq and uh, trying to come up with uh, strategies to minimize the violence uh, in the country. So what does Prime Minister Maliki hope to get out of this meeting with President Barack Obama this Friday at the White House? Counterterrorism uh, assistance is a crucial quest for the Iraqi government because there is a terrorism problem in Iraq. You do have uh, AQI conducting operations on a daily basis and the Iraqi security forces do need a lot of help, especially with counterterrorism. That will be a prior request and a prior discussion for Prime Minister Maliki. I would also anticipate Prime Minister Maliki to explain and uh, present Iraq's position on uh, Syria and what the Iraqi government intends to do. And there might also be uh, discussions uh, by Prime Minister Maliki about the elections uh, that are upcoming and uh, how the Iraq government views those elections. Very likely to be a very uh, comprehensive discussion uh, between uh, Prime Minister Maliki and uh, President Obama. I want to alert our listeners, there was an op-ed that the New York Times ran by Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki uh, just October 29th, so earlier this week. And in that op-ed, he talks about that he plans to propose a deeper security relationship between the United States and Iraq. And he talks about how urgent it is to secure more weapons, particularly the Air Force um, helicopters, being able to secure uh, the porous border with Syria, which as we know right now, you have armed groups crossing back and forth all the time. But one thing that I want to just mention that I thought was really interesting in that op-ed is he did kind of leave things open because I think as I understand it, while Maliki, the Iraqi government, the, the position is really all about the security assistance. That's the most urgent need that they have. And I think that one of the most important outcomes they hope will come out of the meeting is, is a closer relationship, more security assistance. But interestingly, he did say, our government is responding to peaceful protests by engaging in extensive dialogue through the formation of high coordinating committees and we are working to address the demands of protesters, which is a reference to some of these protests that have taken place, especially in the Sunni Arab dominated areas, Anbar province, uh, Salahuddin, other areas um, outside Kirkuk. And I thought that was interesting because I think that creates an opening for the Obama administration. What's your view on that? Well, I think uh, the protest uh, started in December of 2012 and they started because um, the Iraqi government arrested the bodyguards of an Iraqi Sunni politician, uh, the former uh, finance minister, uh, Rafael Aizawi. Uh, that was only the spark for Iraqi Sunni frustration uh, in, in Iraq. The Iraqi Sunnis do not feel that the government treats them barely. They, in fact, feel that they are uh, second-class citizens and that is perception that has to change because uh, in some cases uh, it is correct the Iraqi Sunnis do not get the fair treatment from the Baghdad government the Iraqi Sunnis view the Baghdad government as a as a sectarian government of course uh, one has to keep in mind that uh, even predominantly Iraq Shia provinces do not enjoy a good level of services or a good level of treatment and that includes Basra where the majority of Iraq's revenue comes from because of the oil in that province, but it is a, a, a major issue of reception by mm -hmm. the Iraqi Sunnis. And Prime Minister Maliki is uh, very well positioned uh, to reverse that perception, to uh, ensure that the Iraqi Sunnis get good uh, amount from state resources and uh, better treatment from the Iraqi security forces. And uh, there have been some steps taken by the Iraqi government 
to address protest demands, including uh, release of uh, prisoners, the partially reforming uh, the debathification uh, laws, which uh, the Iraqi Sunnis uh, feel only target them, do not uh, target the Iraqi Shia. But those steps, those decisions are still not perceived as uh, enough by the Iraqi Sunnis. What is very important to understand about the uh, Iraqi uh, Sunni anti-government protest movement is that at the moment Al-Qaeda in Iraq, AQI, is uh, working very vigorously to try to influence those protests and try to make the protests uh, more violent uh, because since December of last year up until now uh, there have not been uh, major violent clashes between the protesters and uh, the Iraqi security forces. Uh, a number of them took place and they were very tragic, uh, one in Hawija that resulted in the death of uh, over 50 people. But overall, uh, the showdown was a political showdown between the protesters and the Iraqi government. Now with AQI attempting to change that dynamic, there is a tremendous risk that discontent Iraqi Sunnis might turn to violence to address their own grievances as opposed to a peaceful uh, manner, which is the protest and elections and political participation. So what do you hope will come out of this meeting? What do you believe that uh, President Obama needs to secure? Because, I mean, I just think back just a couple years, there was the meeting that where this was right around the time when the withdrawal of U.S. forces was completed. and. You know, there was the uh, joint press conference with President Obama and Prime Minister Maliki, and Obama basically talked about this is the leader of a sovereign, independent, uh, democratic Iraq. And shortly after that meeting, then, you know, the Prime Minister goes back to Baghdad, and you had the arrest warrant issued for the Vice President, uh, Tariq Hashimi, and and a number of other uh, political rivals of Maliki that the government went after. And, and then you had a number of other steps of kind of an increasingly authoritarian trend on the part of the Maliki government. You know, how can President Obama ensure that we don't see a repeat of that and start to kind of secure some of the steps that Prime Minister Maliki, as you said, could be taking right now to kind of reverse those perceptions and the alienation of large segments of the population? The first step is making Iraq a priority for the administration. This is a, a difficult process for, uh, for the administration to do, given a, a number of uh, reasons, but Iraq is a significant country. And it's not only significant because of the oil and the natural resources. Geopolitically, it's a very important country. It is uh, interacting very actively with events in Syria. It can make a difference favor of either side that it is supporting. Therefore, it's important for the administration to develop that mindset that working with Iraq is a priority because of its regional pact and because of uh, the potential that could take place from cooperating with Iraq on those issues. For this visit, it is uh, very important for uh, the administration to clarify that the United States recognizes the danger that AQI poses to the security of Iraq and to the security of the region and is willing to help Iraq militarily. But uh, that help should be conditioned on political steps to be taken by the Iraq government in order to uh, reverse violence and change the political momentum that is uh, uh, becoming a factor in escalating the violence. And of course, the administration should encourage fair and free elections in 2014. Uh, this is a very crucial uh, message that can be sent by the administration. In addition to that, the administration is in a great position to send a message to the Iraqis as a public and to the Iraqis as politicians that the United States does not support a particular person uh, for mm -hmm. the prime minister position, mm -hmm. but rather the United States uh, supports open, democratic, free and fair elections that is determined by the Iraqi voter as opposed to any other mechanism. It's interesting that right now here in Washington, D.C., a number of individuals have uh, written op-eds, you know, are talking about what's needed, what they hope to see come out of this meeting. And that also, I guess, is part of the context leading up to this meeting. It's almost like the opportunity is not only for the prime minister, but also for President Obama. Would you agree? 
in terms of like rebalancing U.S. Iraq policy? For President Obama, this is the best moment to reset U.S. Iraq uh, relations. There is uh, increased violence in the country, and that violence is not limited to Iraq. It is, in fact, affecting uh, Syria, and uh, as a result, affecting uh, U.S. policy in Syria. So it is critical for the administration to take advantage of this moment and uh, make it very clear that it is engaged in Iraq. They will continue to be engaged on uh, the highest level possible. I just want a brief excerpt from a letter by Senator John McCain, Senator Carl Levin, and four other senators, in that they basically say, as the United States learned through its own hard experience in Iraq, applying security solutions to political problems will only make those problems worse. If Prime Minister Maliki continues to marginalize the Kurds, alienate many Shia, and treat large numbers of Sunnis as terrorists, no amount of security assistance will be able to bring stability and security to Iraq. But in the same letter, what I thought was interesting is that it, they also are clearly making an argument that we should be prepared to work with the Iraqi government on a whole range of issues, not just on security, but also on supporting free and fair elections, supporting a political process, reconciliation, and also some of the sectors that are so critical for the long-term future uh, for Iraq, like education. Are there anything else? I mean, you, we, we're talking about kind of the big picture about the, the very serious security situation right now in Iraq. Um, not to mention just in the region, you know, you have, in addition to the security side, you also have a hu these huge humanitarian needs. Um, what is it, a quarter of the population of Iraq um, lives at or below the poverty line? Uh, somewhere around three million Iraqis remain displaced, some of whom have been recently displaced, that there's still recent displacement because of the escalation of violence. On top of, of course, the Syria civil war and what's the number now for uh, the number of Syrians who have been uh, displaced. I think it's somewhere around 6 million Syrians have been forced to flee violence. Aside from those big issues, what are some of the partnerships that you hope might develop out of this meeting in terms of other sectors of Iraq? The meeting is an opportunity to establish future long-term relations between Iraq and the United States. And it is critical for the meeting to be the starting point of people-to-people -people relations between the United States and Iraq, which I know something EPIC is uh, doing in many projects. And it is critical for the meeting not just to be a meeting. There has to be follow-up by both the administration and the Iraq government on determining how mutual interest dictates relations between the two countries. And the, the last thing I want to ask in closing is being Iraqi and, and being able to monitor the media there in multiple languages, Kurdish and Arabic, uh, as well as, of course, the English press. And, and also, as I know, you're on Twitter, you're following the, you know, the Twitter sphere. What are you seeing uh, leading up to the meeting in terms of the Iraqi media? And then also uh, related to that, uh, what are young Iraqis saying? What are you seeing on Twitter and, you know, and leading up to the meeting? Overall perception uh, at the moment is that uh, the administration supports Prime Minister Maliki. And uh, this perception is not necessarily linked to the visit, but it is a dominant perception that has been in place uh, for a long time. And uh, it is especially do dominant for the political class uh, in Iraq. And uh, the visit and the meeting between President Obama and Prime Minister Maliki are very opportune moments for the administration to uh, clearly state that the United States supports uh, Iraq and does not mm -hmm. support a particular individual. So more about supporting a democratic process and the Iraqi people and not just the current prime minister. That is a, a very critical and important message to get across. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, My as pleasure. always. We might have to have you come back and we'll do a post-meeting analysis and see what actually comes out of this meeting. I know from EPIC's position or, or perspective, we really hope that doesn't just be a meeting of empty rhetoric, but that we actually see tangible steps and outcomes that come out of this meeting and kind of a rebalancing of the U.S.-Iraq relationship. So it's great to have you and, and maybe we'll have you back to uh, talk about how that meeting goes. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you.
Iraq Matters, an epic podcast of news, ideas, and conversations about Iraq. Thank you so much for joining us. We'd like to thank our special guest, Ahmad Ali, from the Institute for the Study of War. Our theme music is Fakhu Nakhul by Nazim Al-Ghazali. And our transitional music is Rahim Al-Hajj's title track, The Second Baghdad. You can subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This is Shana's Ways reminding you and friends around the world that Iraq matters. Shukran and Zor Swas listeners.